Welcome to the Authentic Change Podcast. I'm Mike Horn, your host. And this podcast is for leaders and coaches who need and want fresh perspectives on what it means to live and to lead authentically. You're a leader who wants to make a difference, but sometimes you feel stuck. You know there's more to life and to leadership than what you're currently experiencing. It can be tough to figure out how to grow as a leader. You might be reading all the blogs and books, but it still feels like you're not making progress. You might even be feeling like you're doing everything wrong. On Authentic Change with Mike Horn, we interview experts who share their insights on how to live and lead authentically. Our guests are trendsetters in building great leaders, teams, and organizations. We provide fresh perspectives on what it means to live with purpose and authenticity. Welcome to this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast. I am absolutely delighted to have in our virtual studio today, Sean Murray, uh, the CEO of Real Time Performance Inc. and the author of a new book, If Gold is Our Destiny, How a Team of Mavericks Came Together for Olympic Glory. And uh, this is the story of the uh, 1984 uh, U.S. men's Olympics team, as much as it is a story about business and a story about uh, living a full life. And I'm so delighted to have uh, uh, Sean here to uh, uh, talk about this. Sean, would you just introduce yourself briefly to our guests, please? Yeah, Mike, thanks for having me on the show. Really looking forward to our conversation. I uh, and we go back a few years, which is kind of nice. Um, we can talk about our, you know, some work we've done together in the past. But so, you know, I work in the area of leadership and organization development, and and that's kind of how our paths crossed. And and I uh, I help organizations, you know, try to reach their potential. And uh, the way I sort of got started, and uh, you, you might wonder, like, well, why why did I write a sports book then? What's going right. on there? You know, uh, that that doesn't make a lot of sense. But uh, what what happened was, you know, about five years ago, my wife gave me a gift, and it was the book "The Boys in the Boat." Uh, I don't know if you read that one. Uh, maybe some of your listeners have. It's a really fun read about a team, well, a crew. Uh, from the University of Washington that in 1936 that went and competed for the Americans that represent the United States at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. And it's just an incredible journey, a wonderful story. And as I was reading the story, it occurred to me how much I learned about leadership and about being in a team, being a part of a team and a culture by reading about this team. And I thought, you know, that's what I do for a living. I, I teach leadership and team building. I thought I'd like to write a story that would help teach, maybe a little bit more modern, but uh, write, write a story that would help uh, us all learn about what it takes to be, you know, to, for our organizations to reach their potential and maybe to become the best, the very best we can be, the best in the world at what we do. And I thought I'd learn a lot by studying a team, you know, really looking at, well, how do they really do it? And of course, sports is something that we all many people can relate to and, and people tend to gravitate to those kinds of stories. And, and so I thought, well, who, what team could I write about? And I happened to have a connection to this team. It just occurred to me, well, my father, who also did work in leadership and organization development, I kind of followed in his footsteps. He was the sports psychologist, uh, some might call him the team psychologist for the 1984 USA men's Olympic volleyball team. And I, they had competed at Los Angeles when I was 13 years old. And I happened to be there at those Olympics because my father was involved with the team. So I knew the coach. I remember the team. I really only remember two things about the team uh, other than they were really good and they won gold. That was, that was the big thing. But also I knew that they had been on an outward bound course through Utah in the middle of winter. And I didn't really know what that was about or why they had been on that course. But that was in the back of my mind. And I thought, you know, I bet there's a story there. And that's what sort of got me into writing this book and and, and brought it to uh, publication. And, and now it's out there. Well, congratulations. And let's talk about the title, uh, uh, If Gold is Our Destiny. And I, I'm going to just hold the other portion. 
uh, how a team of Mavericks came together for Olympic glory. But if gold is our destiny, uh, it seems like it's a, almost a goal setting uh, statement in itself or a visionary statement. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And what caught my ear about that particular statement is it is the potentiality of what exists and what we could become. And it, it was actually said by the team captain, not to give away too much about the book, but the team captain, Chris Marlowe, it was just an amazing person, amazing leader, and was the captain of the team in, in Los Angeles in 1984. Uh, he's since gone on to become, by the way, the um, play-by-play announcer for the Denver Nuggets in the NBA. Oh, interesting. He had a history of uh, also being a basketball player and he's pretty involved in the NBA now. But um, he said to the team that before the gold medal match, he said, you know, if gold is our destiny, and this was sort of a speech where he, he was motivating the team and he was talking about the work that they put in and that they, they deserve to reach the ultimate result from the work that they put in and the commitment they've given to each other and the sacrifices that they made and that the team deserves it, the coaches deserve it, the country deserves it. And so that if gold is our destiny, so be it. And I I heard Chris tell me this in his interview and I I just thought, you know, that I do like the potentiality. I do like the vision feel of that. And that's why I, I, I made it the title. Uh, some people wonder like, well, what does it really mean? Or why does it say... <laughs> Uh, gold is our destiny. But I like the word if. I like the word if because it says, you know, if gold is our destiny, you have to work hard. If gold is your destiny, you have to sacrifice. You have to put the success of the team above yourself. You've got to really listen to your coach. You've got to understand what your role is. I mean, there's, it, as you know, th- there's a lot of lessons in the book about what it takes. And, and I thought the if statement was perfect for what I was trying to do. So I'm glad you caught that. And I hope other readers do too. Well, it's great, uh, Sean, because in many ways, uh, the title, If Gold is Our Destiny, um, How a Team of Mavericks Came Together for Olympic Glory, it really contains the sense of possibility. And this is a possibility story in many ways, not only at the team level, uh, but also at the sport level in the United States and uh, what it meant to uh, have the possibility of a sport becoming widely watched uh, at a time when volleyball was not very popular in the United States. But this book is as much about business teams or organizational teams. You raised a question early in the book, which I think for those in the audience who are connected to developing uh, organizations and developing people and talent and organizations... Maybe what you you sought to answer in this book, among many other things, is um, what you raise. What makes an organization or team perform at its highest level? Maybe you say that's sort of a, a nutshell approach or entry entry point to organization development. But explore that with me a little bit, because this does connect to your professional work at real time performance. Yeah, that that is the central question of the book. It's the central theme. How, in the case of this book, how does this team become the best that it can be? But it, in a way, what I was trying to answer was, how do we all become the best we can be and reach our potential as a team? And it's a it's a fascinating question because it is so complex and there's no simple answer. And, and that's why you can write a book about it. And there's been many books written about it, right? Uh, it, but there's always more we can learn. And I think I learned a lot by studying this particular team. And But I think I would also learn from studying other teams and what they did. You know, there's no blueprint. There's there's no common generic blueprint that you can playbook that you can put out there for um, exactly for every team. Yeah, part of it is you've got to figure out what it is for your for your organization and your team. But there are a lot of common elements, and and that's what I dig into in the book. I mean, we can get into them. And I think one of the big ones is trust. You know, trust in the process, trust in each other, uh, believing in themselves, uh, trusting the coaches that the coaches are trying in their best effort to improve the team, trusting in your teammate when they make a mistake how do you react uh, 
trusting in uh, the the sacrifice that you're going to make for the team. There's there was multiple times when players had to decide what they were willing to sacrifice to help this team get better, and it often included exploring their own ego and understanding what it means to be a part of a team versus you know trying to maximize your own individual goals and things like that. So. I, I think we could go into other elements, but that's, you know, Mike, that's really what the book is about. And I hope that readers, when they walk away, they're going to have a, a sense for, you know, some of those elements that go into the winning formula. And you can pick them off and apply them to a business team, to a nonprofit, to um, any team where humans come together and try to do something that's the result of their collective effort. That raises a couple of points uh, for me, Sean. Uh, one is that, and as some wise person has said, um, you have to trust in order to build trust. And certainly there are those elements that are described so eloquently uh, in the story. And would you think of this, or do you consider it more a story of individual achievement or of team achievement? Is it a book more about uh, some of the all stars or talent that was attracted to this team, or is it more a book about uh, team accomplishment and team dynamics and team components? You know, in, in my opinion, it's it's a book about team, and of course, there's the individuals that make up the team, but it's really about the dynamics, the culture, the relationships. You know what you need to do as individuals to come together to reach your potential right and and you know it's 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 one of the most difficult things we do uh, but it's one of the most prevalent in business today is we form teams all the time and you know how do we how do we help these teams become the best they can be right and that's by studying a team that was as dysfunctional as this team at the beginning, that then was able to become the best in the world at what they did. Not everyone's going to be the best in the world. You don't need to be the best in the world at what you do in a lot of business teams. You just need to be functional. And so by studying a team sort of at the extreme, there's a lot we can learn. And, uh, and it's just fascinating. It's a fascinating subject. So I, I think it's more about team and, and what we need to do to win. Yeah, that's that's my takeaway uh, of this great read. If gold is our destiny, and um, I do want to talk about talent, though, and I particularly want to talk about uh, the role of coaches Doug Beal and Bill Neville, and uh, the impact that coaches, the leaders, you know, had on the development of that team. Yeah, you're you're referencing two of the key coaches of this 1984 team, and the head coach Doug Beal, who was a former player on the national team in the 70s, early 70s, and Bill Neville, who was the assistant coach. There was another assistant coach, but Bill and Doug were a duo in a lot of ways. And what I observed was that they were more powerful; they were more effective as a team than either would have been individually. And I think there's a lot of parallels to that around leadership in business today. You know, when you talk about uh, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, you know, uh, or, you, you know, just Sergey Brin and Larry Page or any, any other. There's, there's a lot of examples of leaders. Uh, I, I think of Lewis and Clark sometimes, you know, it's like, uh, how did Lewis and Clark get all the way across the country and back? I think it was because there was Lewis and there was Clark. Well, I think we don't pay enough attention to pairs in yeah. organization development and the impact on pairs because little innovation happens with individual heroic efforts, usually starting in a pair. Yeah, I think you're right, Mike. And uh, so, so one, a couple interesting things about these two characters and and what they what they were able to achieve. They were sort of opposites. They brought the strengths that they brought to the table and their strengths were sort of compatible to the, maybe you'd say the weaknesses of the other pair. And so together there was a lot of synergy to what they were trying to do. Doug was the more strict, the more visionary, the disciplinarian, the person who instilled 
uh, discipline and demanded commitment and sacrifice from the players and set the bar extremely high for individual and collective achievement and had very, very high standards for the program and was trying to lift it out of mediocrity, a mediocrity that he himself had lived through as a player that it still stuck with him. He didn't like to lose. He wanted to win. He wanted to find a way to win. The volleyball was invented in the United States. And frankly, it was embarrassing to a lot of these players that they'd go to these European tournaments and World Cups and they, they couldn't seem to qualify for an Olympics. They'd never won a medal in a major international tournament. I mean, this was a program that had very little success, very little legacy of winning. And Doug was trying to do that. And he he did it by sort of a force of will. So you can kind of understand the kind of character Doug was. He, he had a very, I'd say emotionally, he was distant from his players because he knew he had to cut some of the players. He didn't want to be as emotionally involved that it would impact his decision making when it came down to paring down from 18 to 20 players who were sort of in the in the orbit of the team in the early eighties to the 12 that would walk into the arena at the Olympics. And, and so to counter that, he had Bill Neville, who was just this incredible relationship driven guy that the players absolutely adored. And he had a relationship with each player and he understood where they, where they were as a player and where they needed to go. And he was there for conversations and he was almost like a trusted friend or um, a father figure to some of the players. And to this day, when you mentioned Bill Neville, it's like they just well up inside, you know. So the two of them together were able to achieve, I think, something that they couldn't individually. And they they played an important role in guiding the organization, guiding the players to um, towards a gold medal. Yeah, it's so interesting how you trace the uh, origins of volleyball and basketball, uh, I think, to a YMCA, I, I want to say volleyball. Yes. yes. Yeah, both sports were invented in the United States. I think it was 11 miles apart in Massachusetts within yes. six or seven years in the late in the 1890s. <laughs> and yeah. they're among the most popular sports in the world today. Fascinating. And isn't the story uh, uh, of If Gold is Our Destiny? Also, a story about different cultures and uh, the uh, both external impact of those cultures. You talk, uh, you describe a lot in the book, um, East Coast versus West Coast, West Coast volleyball uh, versus East Coast volleyball. You describe the differences between uh, beach volleyball and uh, court volleyball. You describe uh, some of the differences between winning teams and losing teams and the cultures that support them. So in some ways, there are a lot of contrasts that work in this uh, landscape or portrait that you paint with of the 1984 uh, U.S. men's Olympic, uh, U.S. men's volleyball uh, team. Yeah, there there were, there was a clash of cultures in some respects. There was a diversity of different types of players in the United States most of the players at the highest level were from California and they grew up playing volleyball on the beach, which led to just certain interesting outcomes for the players as they grew older. They grew up often without the benefit of a coach being there every day, because when you're on the beach, you're just out there playing and having fun. And that led to a certain freewheeling, creative, innovative flair uh, ability to play different positions and try different attacks and techniques. And it was a really fun, creative element in, in the players. And then there were these players that grew up playing at the YMCAs across the country that were, it was six on six indoor volleyball. And Doug Beal, the head coach, he came from Cleveland and he came from that tradition. Interestingly, Doug is Jewish and he, his grandparents uh, both came from the same small town in Poland. And volleyball is very big in Eastern Europe, and it has a long tradition. And, and Doug sort of, it's not that his parents taught him volleyball, but he came into a came of age in Cleveland, in an area where there are a lot of Eastern European cultures, all playing volleyball, uh, Ukrainian teams, Hungarian teams, Bulgarian team, each culture there in, in Cleveland had its own team and he would often jump around from team to team 
And he learned that with when there was a team with a culture, you know, something that united them, like they all spoke Ukrainian or they all uh, hung out together after volleyball, that they played so well together on the court. There was something about that. And so you've got this coach who comes from that tradition, and then you've got these players that grew up on the beach, and they had to find a way to work together. And, and the coach, Doug, brought along a few East Coast YMCA bred uh, players that became known as the Easties. And then they had to somehow learn how to play with the Westies. And, and I think there's a greater story here in just about any team when you've got to bring people together. Sometimes sure. it's marketing and sale or marketing and manufacturing, or sometimes it's from the offshore, you know, from the group that's in uh, a multinational group versus the domestic group. You know, we've got to figure out how to work together. And that's what this team had to do. They had to overcome their differences and, and find that what's the what's the mixture where this optimizes you maximize the mix of your people so it's a it's an amplifier you know that that and that's what they figured out they figured out a way to take the best of both worlds and become even better than any than any than they would be without each other and uh, that is a theme that runs throughout the book isn't it around doing better, not in a rehabilitative sense, but this, this is striving to do better, not, not just to accomplish more, but to do better. Is that, is that right, Sean? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, there, there's a struggle going on um, individually for each player to improve, to try to make the team. And then there's this collective struggle for the team to kind of break out of, uh, like I said, mediocrity and try to get into a medal match. And uh, there's a lot of thought and discussion that goes into how do we do it? How do we, how do we go from 13th in the world, which is where they were in 1982? In 1982, the team went to Argentina for the World Cup and they finished 13th. And this was a, this was a shock because the Olympics were going to be in Los Angeles in two years. It was going to be in their hometown. Most of these players were from Los Angeles, nine of the 12 players. So it, was, it wasn't just that the Olympics were going to be in their home country. The Olympics were literally going to be in their hometown, in front of their family and their friends. And they desperately wanted it to medal. They wanted to be in the top three. And they finished 13th. Now, to go from 13th in the world to meddling in less than 20 months is unheard of. It just doesn't happen. And so they've, you know, they faced that question you 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 just mentioned, like, how do we get better? You know, how do we overcome um, all these obstacles? And, and that's where, you know, they got creative and they decided to also take some risks. And I think you have to take some risk to get better. You have to try things. You might fail. You might, it might not work out and not everything they tried did work out, but they, what Doug Beal told me about that part of the journey was we weren't afraid to look foolish. And I think that's a really important lesson for leaders. Uh, you can't be afraid to look foolish. If you are, you're, you're not going you're, you're to innovate. You're not going to uh, improve. You're not going to get better. And on this uh, journey to be better, uh, you describe, I think it's beginning in chapter nine, uh, an outward bound event uh, that is figural, uh, perhaps for the team, perhaps for you, not perhaps for the team, for the team and perhaps for you in terms of the development of that team. And, you know, maybe this is uh, your uh, father, Don Murray, uh, or his partner, Chuck Johnson, the two psychologists to the U.S. men's uh, volleyball team, uh, had some hand in shaping uh, this experience. And... Why is that? That chapter stood out to me as being important in in a number of ways. Uh, what what makes that cha those chapters uh, dealing with outward bound important uh, as part of the story of uh, the 1984 men's U.S. volleyball team and your story, Sean? Well, it was a it was a pivotal point in their journey towards the Los Angeles Olympics. And it, it, it's along the lines of what I was just talking about as far as not being afraid to look foolish, willing to take a risk. And, and what the coaches and, the, and my father and his partner 
uh, Chuck Johnson and the coaches, they were sitting around, they were talking about, you know, how do we get better? What do we need to do? What's our biggest challenge? And what they came up with was that this team really needs a shared significant life experience, you know, something outside of volleyball that they can experience together that's going to build the bonds of, I don't know if you have to say friendship, but definitely stronger relationships that would help them endure on the court and help them become more resilient. And this was a team that would practice together and then go home, you know, and some of the, there were cliques on the team. Some of the team players played together at UCLA. Some of them played together at USC. Some of them were from the East coast, as I mentioned. And so they were looking for something that would bring them together. And they started throwing around ideas. And, you know, the first idea that came out was kind of interesting was to send them to boot camp. Uh, There's a big Marine base that right. was in San Diego and uh, Camp Pendleton is a big Marine base. I think it's just north of San Diego. And they contacted the Marines and they thought, well, we'll just send them through boot camp. But because, I mean, talk about the premier organization in the world for bringing people together quickly to become a team. I mean, that's the Marines, right? And uh, the Marines said, no, we don't want your volleyball players to go through our boot camp. That's not going to work. So they started throwing around other ideas. And, and what came out was this idea of outward bound. And outward bound, I'm not sure how familiar your listeners are, but um, outward bound is an organization that has been around since just after World War II, maybe it was founded during World War II, and it was founded in England by the merchant Marines who were being attacked by the U-boats during um, World War II. They noticed that the older sailors would often survive, even though they weren't as physically fit. And, and you know, when a ship would go down and they had to somehow you know, get into lifeboats or swim for a while or help each other. And the reason the older men were surviving was because of their mental attitude, uh, their mindset, their ability to help others and not just themselves, uh, to think about having empathy for those around them. And, and they had this inner strength and this resiliency and they, and they, Outward Bound wanted to teach that to the next generation. And, and so that's where it came out of. It was a, a very much a real need during the war. But it grew into this organization where they, the idea was if you put people through experiences that are extremely challenging and you help them see that they can overcome, they can do things that they didn't think they could do, especially together, that you could take that understanding, that new mindset and go off and do amazing things together. So Outward Bound had already been an established organization in the United States, and they were taking groups through wilderness experiences with instructors and the idea was the the individuals and people would come together and 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 leave with this kind of more resilient mindset. So they they asked Outward Bound if they would design a course, and Outward Bound said that they would. And it was, they ended up designing a three week course through really Utah, the Abajo Mountains, and the Canyonlands near Canyonlands National sure. Park yeah. there, near Moab. Yes, that area in winter. You know, in the middle of winter, January, I can't imagine month of January, three weeks. Yeah. I mean, and the players did not want to go, you know, so here's this idea that was hatched by the coaches and the psychologists were going to go on this thing and the players didn't want to be there and they invented all kinds of excuses to not go. And the coaches were determined to do it. And so that set up a really interesting dynamic for this journey towards the gold medal, which was, okay, we're going to go on a three week outward bound course. Um, you got to go on it if you want to be on the team and um, we're going to come out of this stronger. And they went in and that was the premise. And that's how they ended up uh, with 70 pound packs and snowshoes on January 7th, 1983, standing in like four feet of snow out in the middle of nowhere with about a hundred miles to hike and uh, three weeks and all their food and everything on the back of their backpacks. And um, it's an interesting uh, little experience that they went through there. It sounds a little like my uh, Peace Corps experience when I left Tony Ara in the Solomon Islands and went out to Boala on uh, Isabel, uh, you know, light years away from uh, any uh, urban situation. 
Yeah, I bet there's some parallels there, you know, I'm going sure. through an experience like that. Are you still friends with your Peace Corps peers that you went through the Peace Corps with? I feel connected to them. I am in contact with a few of them. We were in a very small program. I think there were eight people in the group that we went with. And uh, it was a couples only program at the time. So it was four couples and uh, very intense um, experience and introduction to uh, village life and uh, life in a rural community and life in the Solomon Islands at that time. So yeah, um, good stuff. But let's get back to um, the talent story of the game. There were departures and joiners, uh, people coming and going on this team. Uh, the Chris Marlowe story is uh, fascinating and uh, uh, the stories of resilience uh, that accompany that. And also thinking about uh, um, just what it means to choose and select talent and deselect talent. Um, how, how does that figure into the story as you spoke with uh, those that with whom you were able? How, how did that figure into the story? Well, it sort of crosses over into the into the outward bound, which I want to just talk yes. about a little bit more too, because there was a very good player. Uh, many people thought he was the best player uh, on that team. Now, there was a, a very well-known player that was quite young at the time named Karch Karai. Karch went on to become the volleyball player of the century as voted by the International Federation. So he was sort of the... Uh, and the person who wrote the foreword to your book? Yes, he wrote the foreword to my book. He was um, he just an incredibly accomplished volleyball player. And currently, I believe, uh, co still coaching volleyball. Is that right? Yeah, he coaches the women's U.S. women's national team, and yep. he coached them to their first gold medal last summer in Japan, which what was, I recalled. Yeah, it was a really nice kind of thread from the early 80s when he showed up as a very young player on this team, this national team, to coaching the women to their first gold. And it's just He's an amazing guy, and I was very fortunate that he wrote the forward. But, you know, Karch, a lot of people now think he was the best player on, on that team, and he probably was. But there was another player that was also very, very talented at the time that was in his prime. Karch was still in college, just one year out of college at the 1984 Olympics. And there was a, a player, Tim Hovland, who is an incredible athlete and was – widely known as the best player in the United States at the time. And Tim wanted to play professionally instead of training with the national team. And he also wanted to play in beach tournaments. And he was a very, very good beach volleyball player. And so Doug Beal said, you know, um, if you want to be on this team, you can't play professionally. You've got to play. Part of that was just the, the rules around being an amateur and was kind of not impossible, but difficult for players to go to Europe and play and then come back and be an amateur for the Olympics. Totally different amateur rules back then, as you probably remember. Yeah, but and then the, the beach tournaments, you know, giving up the beach tournaments and then going on this outward bound. You know, eventually there was a decision about, I would say, commitment. How committed are you to this team? What kind of sacrifice do you want to make? And, and Tim Hovland eventually decided that, he, well, I might put it this way, Tim and Doug Beal could not come together to figure out a way that Tim could reach some of his individual goals and be on the team because Doug really demanded certain things of his players. And so Tim Hovland was off the team. He did not go on the outward bound. Uh, he did not eventually, he thought maybe he, he would come back on the team, you know, as we got closer to the Olympics, that the team would need him. But they decided that uh, they had a winning culture and that the team would be strong they had a strong team. They didn't need Tim to come back. And they they ended up going to the Olympics without Tim Hovland, which a lot of people said, you know, couldn't be done. Or either that or they were crazy, because why would you not go with the most talented player in America? Well, the what happened was the coaches said for, you know, we want not necessarily the best players in America. We want the best players that play together as a team that are committed to a team. And that's a great lesson for all of us, for business, for sports, for any enterprise, that there's talent and you need talent to have a great team, but you also need commitment to it, to the team and commitment to the values. 
and the principles. And uh, you talk a lot about integrity and authenticity in your work. And, and that's exactly, you know, what we're talking about here is that Doug Beal was demanding that, um, was was setting the standard. And, and so um, <laughs> they ended up finding a winning formula without the best player in America. And the journey wasn't an easy one to get to. I mean, there were all kinds of environmental stumbles. I mean, the boycott of the U.S. Olympics uh, one year. Uh, it's just quite a story about uh, the buildup to 1984. Yeah. I mean, the, the program was based in Dayton, Ohio, was really struggling. The players would, didn't want to go out there. They, they it, it wasn't working there. They moved it to San Diego. They tried to qualify for the Olympics in, in 72 and 76 and 80. Each time they were unable to do it. They just they were sort of pulling together, I call an all-star team at the last minute to try to beat teams that had been playing together for a while, like the Soviet Union and Poland and others in Japan. You know, America sometimes thinks we've got we've got the players, we've got the talent, let's just put them, put them together. Three months before the Olympics, we'll practice around a little bit, and uh, I'm sure we'll do we'll do great, you know. And they didn't; they, they just were they were failing, and that's that's where Doug Beal, who was a player during that era, decided, you know, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to demand that they be a part of a team, that they stay committed. We're all going to go on this outward bound together, and um, you know. And I did want to mention something about outward bound. It's not just that it was hard, and that they had these 70 pound packs, and they were snowshoeing and I think that what happened in Outward Bound as I read the trip reports and I did the research was they had to survive together. And that's a really important experience when your survival depends on others. So, for example, there's just the idea of breaking trail. You know, when you are out in front, someone's pushing the snow in front of you. And to go 10, 15 miles in snowshoes in a day with a pack on, you really depend on someone breaking trail. And then that person goes to the back of the line, someone else. So just moving from point A to point B is a collective effort. And then when you get to point B, it's getting dark. Somebody needs to clear out the snow. Someone needs to set up a tent. Someone needs to go gather firewood. Someone's going to start a fire. Someone's going to cook the, fee- the the meal or the food. It, it's together. They, they did it together. And then they slept very soundly and got up the next day and did it again. And you do that day after day for weeks at a time and you become a unit. You know, you become something, a cohesive unit, something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. And that's what they did. And when they came back from Outward Bound, I think they had trust. That's what that gave them just. There was trust before, but whatever it was they had when they came back, it was it was more. And they started winning and they started to try different things and to innovate. And they got creative. They invented a a way to play volleyball that is still played today called the American system. And they wouldn't have done it, in my opinion, if they hadn't built that foundation of trust. And uh, it is a great uh, case too for what makes an effective team. I mean, creating uh, psychologically safe environments, uh, creating a Room for authentic leadership, all built around uh, uh, trust and how we relate with one another. Uh, so important in today's uh, workplace. Um, it is uh, just a fascinating story. This 1984 U.S. men's Olympic volleyball team and their uh, journey to gold. Uh, Sean Murray is the CEO at Real Time Performance, host of the Good Life podcast, and uh, most recently, author of If Gold Is Our Destiny. And Sean, if um, you know our audience, um, if you were to give them sort of one or two um, teasers or reasons to read uh, out of all the great description um, that you've provided today. What 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 might those be? What what's what's the what's the call to action uh, here from your perspective? Well, it's in the larger sense, it's a story about how individuals come together to to be a team and to be collectively better than they can be individually and to achieve something that they couldn't achieve alone. And I, to me, that's so important to being successful in life, to being successful in business. And any way that we can get better at that and come at it from a different angle or try different uh, techniques or tools, 
uh, I think is well worth our time. And this is just an entertaining story about how this particular group kind of cracked that, you know, and, and, and figured out how to do it. And if they could figure it out, I think we can figure it out because it's not like it was easy for them. You know, they really had to work at it. Uh, I'll just, I'll give you a little example. At the time, the team thought that they needed to copy the best teams in the world to win because the U.S. had no history of winning, had no history of winning a medal at the Olympics. And so what do you do in that situation? You often look to the teams that are winning and say, okay, let's copy what they're doing. And that's a, that's a great technique. I, I, I think it's, uh, I'm not disparaging that, but it's kind of interesting what happened when they went to do it because they went and studied the Soviet Union, which was the best team in the world at the time. And what they discovered was that the types of players that the Soviets had fit in well with that type of system, which was, I would say, more of a disciplinary and command and control, very much a structured kind of a, almost like a monolithic machine of volleyball that, they, that played at a very high level. And they were big and they could block. And, and the coaches looked at the players they had and these, these beach guys from California that were very creative and doing different things that that no one had ever done before on a volleyball court. And they thought, okay, that's that's not maximizing what we have. So they went to the Japanese, which are a little bit smaller, more nimble. And they looked at that system and that the coach, they, cause they had won a gold medal. And, and the coach of the Japanese system was actually very open to sharing how they did it. They made videos, they gave presentations, they invited the coaches over and the U S coaches, asked him, his name was Matsudera. They said, why are you giving away all your secrets? And he said, well, only the Japanese can play like the Japanese. So if you want to copy our system, it's going to be like a Xerox copy was the way he described it. And if you make a copy of a copy of a copy, well, now you're three generations degraded and you're, you're never going to be as good as the original. And that was a light bulb for the coaches. To, they thought, okay, if we are going to win, if we're going to maximize our potential, we have to figure out how to develop a strategy and an approach to volleyball and a team that maximizes our unique skills and what we bring to the table, which is a certain American culture at the time, uh, that the volley beach volleyball roots that went deep on this team. And through trial and error, you know, no one sat down to design it, but Every day they went in and they tried new things and they listened to each other and they ended up developing um, different, you know, strategies to volleyball that were quite innovative and ended up becoming, I'd say the key is much more specialized. Each player got very, very good at what they did as opposed to trying to be more generalist, which a lot of the teams were more generalist at the time. So, for example, instead of having four or five people, four people in the back row, they only had two to receive the serve. And that became an important piece. And then how they how they directed the offense, there were a lot of what I would call audibles, where the players on the court could call different plays. And, and this was new. It was a way for the creative energy of the players to flourish as opposed to a coach trying to draw something up. They, they created a system where the players could read the defense and try to attack it based on what they were seeing. And this was all you know, something that they developed after Outward Bound. And it wasn't top down. It was mutu mutually developed by the players and the coaches together. And, uh, and I think that's just a great example, just one example of like you know, what this team did to, to become great. And and one of many lessons you can pull from studying a team like this to apply to your own world. Uh, yeah, amazing. It's an amazing story. I uh, encourage everyone to uh, check out Amazon uh, for Sean Murray's uh, book, If Gold. Sean, you do it for us. You do it this time. <laughs> if Gold is Our Destiny, How a Team of Mavericks Came Together for Olympic Glory. You can find it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and for just about any place online. And, um, you know, you, you, you can, I just appreciate if anyone takes the time to read it. I just want to say thank you. Oh, uh, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Sean. It is a, a great read. And if people wanted to get in touch with you and uh, real-time performance, uh, how would they do that? Well, my website is realtimeperformance.com. I, I write regularly there, uh, articles and a blog. And there's also a link to my podcast, The Good Life. 
And uh, I have a Twitter as well, which is Sean P. Murray 111. And I regularly kind of post to that too. So just feel free to reach out to me, go to the website, you can find my information and I'd be happy to talk to anyone who's you know interested in exploring these things. That's great at realtimeperformance.com. That's correct. All right, Sean, thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's been a great uh, pleasure to meet with you today, to be in conversation with you and to talk about the great work you're doing and the release of uh, your new book. Uh, until the next episode of the Authentic Change Podcast, stay well. Thank you for listening to the Authentic Change Podcast. I'm delighted that you've tuned in to listen. Please visit the show notes for links to topics discussed in today's podcast. To download a free ebook on authentic change and leadership and to subscribe to my newsletter, please visit mike-horn.com. Once again, M-I-K-E dash H-O-R-N-E dot com, Mike dash horn dot com. Once again, thank you for listening to the Authentic Change Podcast.